If you have your Bible, open it to uh, Luke chapter 1. There's uh, wonderful things about the Christmas season. And one of them is that there are certain things we get to preach on this time of year that we don't, well, I guess we could preach on them anytime, but we don't preach on them other times in the year. I don't know how well the virgin birth would go over in July. I guess it would go over fine. Um, but uh, I want to talk about the virgin birth today. And uh, this was uh, one of those weeks that um, I have done a lot of praying this week. As you know, our Supreme Court uh, took up a case uh, in Mississippi that had to do with um, the terms of what abortion would be. And it brought up, um, more than anything else, it brought up when is life. And that's what they're trying to decide. Or they're actually, I don't know what they're trying to decide. Um, I know what the parameters of the court case is that is before them. But really, there are, there are two sides, there are two divides there. One who wants their way and one who believes in the truth of life. And those battles that have become ingrained in our society did not begin in the last few weeks or the last few months. It began a long time ago, and we'll talk about that this morning. But if you have your Bible, and you're open up to Luke chapter 1, uh, stand up with me in honor of reading God's Word. God woke me up before 3 o'clock this morning. And I, I just want to say to you, um, so very grateful that he allows me to be a preacher of the good news of Jesus Christ. Just to proclaim the gospel of our Lord uh, thrills my soul. Um, let's begin reading in verse number 31. Well, let me back up. Let me get it on verse 30. I told the guy verse 31, but I'm going to get a running start. He says uh, in verse 30, Then the angel said to her, that is Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Literally, Hebrew, Joshua, Greek, Jesus, literally means Jehovah saves. That's what it means. Salvation is of God. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Highest, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Christmas season. We thank you for all the things that it means to us, the believers in you, those who have been born again, those who cherish you, Jesus, those who are very grateful for the gift of eternal life. Now, Father, we pray that in the next few minutes that we would be open to You, Spirit of the living God. Lord, we know that there are other spirits that are at work in this world, but we want to bow before no spirit other than Your Spirit. We want no spirit to speak except of Your Spirit. All other spirits need to be quiet in our head and in our heart. We don't want to hear their whispers or their yells. We want to Bow the knee to you and to you alone. You are our God. You are the King. You are the Supreme. And Lord, we recognize that. So Lord, uh, in the next few moments, remind us again of the truths of your Word and what that means to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. The beginning of life, the beginning of time, begins really as explained to us in the book of Genesis. As a matter of fact, the first four words in the Bible, in the beginning, God. That settles it. There is a God. You can call Him a, a supreme being. You can call Him the author of intelligent design, if that's what they want to call it. But He was the Creator God. He was there before all. He has no beginning. And praise God, He has no end. And he, one of His first creations 
were the angels. The seraphim, the cherubim, the archangels, and the angels, they were there. And there began to be among them a fall in the ranks of the angels. The Bible tells us that one-third of the angels, though they were in the presence of of the glory and the splendor and the majesty of the Almighty, though they were there in the perfection and the purity of our God, somehow, though they were there before the humble God, pride rose up within them, and they wanted to put themselves at the same level as God. There is no one ever created that could ever be at the same level as God. We were all created uh, to give him the honor and praise that he deserves and to serve him out of a heart of gratitude that is there. And and that's what we find there. But from that time, they raged war against the one that they knew was pure and holy. The only way that they could raise themselves up is by trying to lower him down. So they attack him on any level, on every level possible. This is nothing new. It's been going on since the Garden of Eden when the serpent came to come after Adam and Eve. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And they attack Jesus on many fronts. And one of the ways that they wage war is on the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior. I find that interesting because if we took a a poll among believing Christians and you ask them the simple question, do you believe in the virgin birth? It would be pretty much unanimous that they would say, yes, I believe in the virgin birth. Yet they give it very little thought. They just accept it. They were told that he was born of a virgin so they just accept, well, the virgin birth. But here's the problem with that. Where you give it very little thought, Satan will attack with doubt. We need to know with assurance. We need to know why we believe in the virgin birth. We need to understand the, the, that the virgin birth is one of the pillars of Christianity. And he is going to try to make it that anyone who believes in the virgin birth is somewhat unintelligent or literally foolish or stupid. And it's been that way all the way down through the years, all the way down through the years. There's been many stories. Some said, well, obviously, Mary had Jesus because of Joseph. One story that was written in the Talmud, which was uh, the the Jewish writings in that day. They believed that Mary, uh, there was a story that Mary was impregnated by a um, um, Roman officer by the name of Panthera. And that has been distributed. It's one of those, because it's part of the Jewish writings, not the biblical account, but the Jewish writings, that it just took a life in and of itself. And it stayed for for centuries and centuries. As a matter of fact, in the 1700s, there was a French uh, philosopher named Voltaire. He brought it back up again. In the 1800s, there was a a Russian novelist and author by the name of Tolstoy, and he did the same thing. He brought that same story back up again. There's always someone there that's going to try to uh, diminish the virgin birth of Christ. Always someone attack it. Jesus was talking to the uh, Pharisees in John chapter 8. He said to them, this quote, I am with the Father who sent me. Then he went on to say, you neither know me or my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Then, John 8, verse 19, the Pharisees said to Jesus, where is your father? They put the question mark over it. The story of Jesus' immaculate conception had been around. It is surrounded through, but but people just very quickly just wanted to 
to, to dismiss it. As a matter of fact, it was the early church where they took those stories and tried to put it in with, with Scripture, the truth of what happened in the life of Mary. And, and they put it in with Scripture of the Old Testament and began to preach it in truth. And that's really what I want to do today. I just want us to look at it because this is what we need to understand. There needs to be no question marks on it whatsoever. I really believe if you put a question mark there, Satan will come in and create more and more doubt. Look what it says in Luke 1. Let's go back there in, in verse 31 and take a run and start. You will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, Call his name Savior. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. I mean, there, she's got to be thinking Messiah now, right? He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary then said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? I'm a virgin, never been with a man. How can I conceive? How can I have a child? Listen to the response in verse number 35. The, answer, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The birth of Christ is a work of the Holy Spirit. In the beginning of his life, he was born by the Holy Spirit with Mary. The Holy Spirit was there to give him life at his birth. At the end of his life, when he died on the cross of Calvary and was placed in the tomb, the Holy Spirit was there too to give him resurrected life. The Holy Spirit was there at his beginning into humanity and his resurrection in humanity. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit was with him every step of the way in his life to lead him and to guide him. He created him in the womb. He raised him from the dead. He was always the empowerment in Jesus' life. When Jesus spoke with authority, it was because of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus gave sight to the blind, it was because of the power of the Holy Spirit. When he gave the lame the ability to walk, when he gave the, the mute the ability to speak, Everything that he did, that anointing that was upon him, and every aspect of his life was by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Jesus' birth was the creation of a body that we needed. Hebrews 10 says it was the body that would come and be the fulfillment of the sacrifice for sin. Let me read to you, I believe, one of the great passages on this, one of my favorite passages in all of God's Word, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Look at this phrase now. Taking the form of of a servant, a bond servant. He took the form of a human servant and becoming in the likeness of men. He was like us. The God of eternity, the spirit of life, came and was fashioned in a way like we are where he could go through things that we go through. He could feel the things that we go through. I was talking to someone this week, and they said, oh, Jesus had a perfect body. He never had any blemish. And I'm like, where are you getting that from? Well, he was God. He was perfect. Yes, but he fashioned him in a way like you and I, where he would have to face everything that we face. Come on now. Feel everything that we feel. Grow tired, grow hungry, grow weak. Temptation is not sin. He faced temptation, yet without sin. He had to have the body. 
He had to have the ability to go through life, to face the trials of life, and to choose to be obedient unto God. So we see, I want to tell you, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. The gospel begins in Bethlehem. The gospel is every day, every step that he took, every conversation, every healing, every time that he preached. The gospel was there when they whipped him. The gospel was there when they pulled out his beard and cursed him. The gospel was there when he denied the right of being the, the God of the universe, but humbled himself even to the point of crawl, the cross. The gospel was when they nailed him there. The gospel was when he bled, listen to me now, and died and rose again. He had to be that full, complete, and total sacrifice. He could not have been that had it not been for the purity of his birth, the virgin birth. There are two great biological miracles of God. Now stick with me for the next few minutes. Two biological miracles. The first came with Adam. God formed Adam out of the dirt. God breathed life into him. And the life of humanity began with Adam. And in us, that is me, that is you, there is, uh, in all of us, we have what we call cell division. If y'all remember science or biology, it was called mitosis. Right? There is a cell within us, matter of fact, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, right, of cells within us, and they divide and grow and divide and grow. As a matter of fact, y'all got cells dying in you all over the place. I mean, you don't even know it, but they're dying all over the place. But guess what? There are others that are being recreated in the cell division within us. Now, this is the miracle of of life that we have in humanity. In every one of us, there's a cell. And in that cell, there are 46 chromosomes. 46. Every one of them. Anybody ever heard of DNA? Y'all wake up. All right. I mean, I know y'all have seen a crime show on TV, and they say, well, the DNA doesn't lie, right? Well, in each, each DNA in every cell in your body, you will find 23 chromosomes that came from the mom and 23 chromosomes that came from the dad. And they came together, and when they came together, life began. Life began. And mitosis, or cell division, began to happen. Now, <clears throat> this week I said... The Supreme Court was looking uh, at a Mississippi law where the Mississippi state law says that you cannot have an abortion after the, the, the baby is 15 weeks old in the mother's womb. Well, in 1973, Roe v. Wade said that it was legal in every place in America for a woman to have abortion. They divided Roe v. Wade into trimesters. The first trimester... It was between the mother and the doctor to decide when they wanted to have it. The last trimester, it, it was pretty much you had to have special reasonings why you could have an abortion. And all the different states came up with the others. And there was that middle ground that was always kind of mushy, meshy around. And certain states would say, you, you, can, you can do it, oh, you can do it anytime for any reason whatsoever. Others said, no, 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 got limitations on it. Okay? And in 1990, uh, uh, I believe it was 1991, in Casey, uh, they came back and they said, well, it's not a matter of trimesters, they threw that out, but they said it's the viability of the child. Now, come on, listen to me. They said that 
what matters is that the child can exist outside of the womb. And life does it. They, they, their thought is it's not a life, they call it a fetus, until it can survive on its own. And it became the viability rule. And in Casey, they tried to say that was 26 weeks. Now, how many of y'all know that when God created us, the, the, the women's cycle is to go for 40 weeks is what they call it, nine months, right? Can we all agree on that? Say amen. And, and the baby is supposed to stay inside for all nine months. It comes in 26 weeks, something's wrong, right? And, and, and there are times that, that with medical care and incubators and all that kind of stuff, that they can help the young baby, and it maybe can. But all they were trying to do was back it up, back it up. They're trying to say it doesn't have a cortex. It's not life unless it can live outside the womb. That's not science. That's not truth. And the people who know DNA understand and know that. It's amazing to me that all the doctors, all the doctors state that life is in the mitosis. When the woman's egg is there and is fertilized by the seed of man, 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, they come together and life is there. Life begins at conception. Conception. And at that particular point in time, it begins to grow. Yes, it's small. But these women, they go and they have these ultrasounds now. I mean, when Lynn was pregnant and they gave us, they did the ultrasounds, all I saw was a fuzzy TV screen. Amen? Y'all remember those? And they've gotten better at it. And, and I think one time with Jody, I could see her blink. Right? I, 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 but, but listen, all I could see was a bunch of fuzz, and they said, mm -hmm, I know what that's going to be. And I'm like, I don't see it. I don't see it, right? But, but it would be small, and it would become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they can see all these things. You know why it's getting bigger? It's because it's life, and it has a heartbeat, and all these things are forming within it. Yes, it's supposed to go to 40 weeks, but it's not... Life at 40 weeks, it's not a fetus that becomes a baby. It's always a child of God. This is the miracle of God's biological birth. It was with Adam. It's with us. It's the way that it happens. Amen? We comes together, mitosis, cell division. But there's another miracle that happened. There was this little girl by the name of Mary. She's minding her own business, a virgin. And Gabriel, by the way, an angel, I love this, a servant of the Most High, told by God to do something, is honored to go and to honor him and bring him glory by going and, and stating exactly what God sent him to do. He goes to, to Mary and says, uh, hey, Mary, you're going to have a child. What? I, I, let me just say this, what Scripture says. How can this be? Verse 34, since I do not know a man. I, I don't know everything, but I know it's got to be man and woman to have a child. Amen? That's, that's the way that it is. Well, the angel answered and said, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will come and envelop you. The Holy Spirit will come and just be upon you, almost, we could say, almost like a blanket. In Matthew uh, 17 and Mark chapter 9, Jesus goes up with uh, three of his disciples up on the mountain. And as he is there and he is praying, the disciples fall asleep. I guess they thought Jesus praying was boring. We don't know how long he was doing it. But Jesus was transfigured is the word that they use. Literally changed right in the presence. The glory that he had laid down when he left heaven, 
in that moment, the glory of, of God was upon Jesus again. The disciples wake up and they see Jesus there and this bright glory. Moses and Elijah are there and they're ministering to him. They're talking with him. This is the turning point of his ministry. He's now facing the cross. He's, he's having the word. This is where it's going. And Peter jumps up and says, hey, this is good. Let's do something about this. Let's build a booth or something for all three of you. You know, he didn't really know what to say. And, you know, sometimes if you don't know what to say, just keep your mouth shut, right? He didn't do that. Couldn't do that, I guess. I don't know. But it says that God came there and the glory engulfed them. Come on now, same word, overshadowed them. And God spoke and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Same word, overshadowed him. The glory, the Shekinah glory of God, the Spirit of God, the, the one that was a pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Many times throughout history, we've heard the stories where, where God would come among His people and it would be like a thick cloud would be sitting upon them. Same word. Mary, you may be a virgin, but understand, understand the Holy Spirit will come to you. It will envelop you. Envelop you. Let me uh, share with you what um, Gabriel, same angel, told Joseph. Y'all remember Joseph? He had to figure this thing out too. It says... In Matthew 1, verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was, uh, was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, come on now, before they came together, before they came together, y'all know what I'm talking about? Shake your head. All right. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was mindful to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, here he's quoting Isaiah. Be, be, behold, the virgin, the virgin shall be with child. Not the virgin who got pregnant. The virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He's God with us because he was God with her. The Holy Spirit came and and overshadowed her. By the way, this is the gospel. This is exactly what happens when a person believes in Jesus, believes that he was God's son sent to earth, believes that he was born of a virgin in Bethlehem, lived a sinless life for nothing that he did on his own, but, but because he was falsely accused, he was put on a cross and crucified. And he gave his life and was resurrected. And all of us who know that, and all of us who believe it, and all of us who feel that wooing from God and are convicted of our sin and, and turn from our sin and say, this is not right. I must follow God. I believe in Jesus. I need His salvation. Lord, come to my life. Save me. I will follow you. My life is now yours. At that moment in time, the Holy Spirit will engulf you. The Holy Spirit will birth you. The Holy Spirit, let me use the theological word, will regenerate. Give you new life. Give you eternal life. And by the way, 
Once you have eternal life, you cannot die again. You may die a physical death, but your soul will never die. Your spirit will live forever. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. Let me give you a, a word from a Genesis. You remember in the Garden of Eden where Eve messed up? God came down and spoke to him about what he was going to do. By the way, he spoke to Satan too. Genesis 3.15 says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, that is Jesus, shall bruise your head. Literally, some translations say crush your head. You shall bruise his heel. But notice it said, between your seed and her seed. Women don't have seed. Her seed is the Holy Spirit coming and breathing life in her. That's where the Messiah would come. That's where it would come. So Isaiah says this, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. I like what Paul said in Galatians 4. He said it this way, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. I am made of man and woman. If you look at my DNA, I got 23 chromosomes of mom. I got 23 chromosomes of dad. Last Christmas, I got one of those little kits, you know, where you spit into it, and you shake it up, and you spit into it, and you, you send it off, and they'll come back, and they'll tell you everything about your DNA. And, and, and by the way, it tells me who all my relatives are. I got relatives in Gainesville I didn't even know about. I got relatives all over. I even got relatives in California. You know, every family's got those, right? And I, it'll tell me the ones that it's on my mama's side, and it'll tell me the one that's on my dad's side, right? But he said, hold on, not Jesus. He's got his mama in him. That's what made him the son of man. But he's got his father in him. That's what made him the son of God. So we have the one who died for our sins on the cross, it had to be a human sacrifice, Hebrews 10 tells us. But he was yet without sin because he was the Son of God. And right now on the throne in glory, right now sitting on the throne in glory is the Son of God who is the Son of Man. Still has scars. Still has scars. In his flesh, though his spirit is whole. That's the gospel, folks. The good news is that God gave us a chance. The good news is that God loved us enough to make a way. The good news is, is that he loves you with an everlasting love. He wants to be with you forever. He wants to do what he did for Mary. Mary said, how can this be? And Jesus said to her in Luke 1, for with God, nothing will be impossible. You cannot have salvation if it wasn't a virgin birth. You cannot have life unless you're engulfed in the Spirit. And yes, this thing of abortion that's just another thing that Satan's doing, trying to take away life. You know what bugs me about it? Can I, can I get on my bully pulpit for just a second? You know how they framed it? As a right. A woman's right. Genesis 3, a woman has a right to be a mom. 
which is an amazing, wonderful thing. We couldn't get here without her. She gets the great right to bear children, to love children, to endure their pain. I was there coaching Lynn when she was going through it. And yet all of that was put behind her because of the joy of the birth. She has a right, but not to take the lot. And yet so many today have believed the lie of the devil. I wonder how many others are believing the lies of the devil. Jesus comes like He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And they're looking for any other way to get to God. But there's only one way. Just one. I hope and pray that all that are listening, whether they're in the room or they're watching us online or watching us today or watching us a year from today, I hope that they would check their spirit. I hope they would listen in their heart make sure things are right between them and God because there's only one way to have life abundant life eternal life that's from giving Jesus your heart and your life let him make you new